So what's the upshot of that quiz? The upshot is that we now know what optimal solutions have to look like. So if you're telling me you have a minimum cost path from one to J that visits every vertex exactly once, I know there are N minus two and only N minus two candidates for what your path could possibly look like. As soon as you tell me the penultimate vertex K, as soon as you tell me that the last hop of your path is K comma J, I know what the rest must look like. It must look like a minimum cost path starting at one, ending at K, visiting the vertices of V minus J and only the vertices of V minus J. So that is the subproblem that the path prefix P prime solves optimally. So now that we understand that there's only these N minus two possibilities for what the one to J path looks like, we can write down a recurrence which expresses the cost of that optimal solution in terms of the costs of the N minus two smaller optimal solutions. So let me introduce a little notation so we can specify the recurrence uh, succinctly. By capital C uh, subscripts capital S comma J, I'm going to mean the minimum cost of a path that satisfies the following four properties. Number one, the path should start at vertex one. Number two, the path should end at the vertex J. Number three, the path should be cycle free so it doesn't visit any vertex more than once. And number four, the vertices that it visits exactly once should be precisely the vertices in the set capital S. So for example, in this cartoon on the upper right part of the slide, imagine that the sort of outer magenta circle is the set of all of the vertices, and then the top set is S, and then the bottom is the other vertices V minus S, and this light blue path is meant to sort of indicate that this path is visiting each vertex of S uh, exactly once. So we want to know, so this notation is the minimum cost of any path that looks like that. And what did we learn from the quiz? Once you know K, you know what the rest of it looks like. The path prefix must be the opt the minimum, a minimum cost path from one to K that's cycle free and visits exactly the vertices of V minus J. And then of course, you know, the original path that went all the way to J, it also pays for that additional hop. So the cost of the edge from K to J. So again, if you prefer to think about dynamic programming recursively, this is basically saying to solve the original problem, you need to make n minus two recursive calls uh, to compute the optimal solutions to these different subproblems. And then you take the best of all of the solutions returned by those n minus two recursive calls. Now, of course, you know, that recursion is going to continue, right? So you need to solve these n minus two smaller problems on the right hand side. But how do you solve that? Well, you just apply the exact same recurrence again, this time to the smaller set of vertices. So more generally, if we replace capital V in this equation with any subset capital S of vertices, we get exactly the same recurrence. So in words, if you show me an optimal path that visits exactly the vertices in capital S, it goes from one, it goes to J and it's cycle free. If you tell me the penultimate vertex on that path, I know what the rest has to look like. It's going to be a subpath. Now it visits all of the vertices of S except for that last endpoint J, and it visits the other vertices S minus J exactly once uh, in a cycle-free way while going from 1 to K. So that's the general version of the recurrence for any vertex subset capital S. So this now tells us uh, exactly what our subproblems should be. Basically, we need a subproblem for every term that might show up in one of these recurrences. So for every choice of the vertex subset capital S, and for every choice of that last vertex little j, we're going to need a separate subproblem to compute that capital C S comma j. So which of these terms do we need to worry about? Which choices of capital S and little j actually make sense? Uh, well, remember capital S, those are the uh, vertices that the path is supposed to visit. And the path is supposed to start at vertex one. So the set capital S better include the vertex one. Uh, also remember J, that's where the path ends. So capital S better also include the endpoint J. So you're going to have one of these terms for each choice of J and each choice of capital S that includes both vertex one and that choice of the endpoint J. So the bad news is this is a lot of subproblems, an exponential number, right? Because uh, there's N vertices. Uh, so there's two to the n different subsets of vertices. Now, capital S here, it can't be any vertex subset. There's a couple mild constraints, but still there's an exponential number of different capital S's 
that you need to worry about. Plus, then there's, again, another uh, linear and n number of choices of j. So that's a bummer that there's an exponential number of subproblems. But uh, remember, we were expecting this, right? If we were, you know, the TSP is NP hard. So if we're going to apply dynamic programming, we need to expect, you know, something exponential to show up somewhere, either in the number of problems or in the time required to solve each subproblem or in the post-processing step. And just looking at the many examples that we've seen, it seems like the extra complexity always shows up in the number of subproblems. So we were actually expecting to see an exponential number. So this actually is telling us we're probably on the right track. I also want to point out that while exponential, it's a lot better than n factorial. It's more like 2 to the n than n factorial. And the reason why where that savings is coming from uh, is that these subproblems don't worry about the order in which the vertices of capital S are visited. So it tracks which subset of vertices a path is visited, but not the order in which they were visited. And that's why the factorial goes away and is replaced by the simple exponential function 2 to the n. So we've got almost all our ducks in a row, right? We have our subproblems. We came to them by this thought experiment of what optimal solutions have to look like. That led us to our recurrence. Uh, and so now we just want to solve all these subproblems systematically from smallest to largest. There's a very natural ordering from smallest to largest, depending on how many vertices the path visits, depending on the size of the set capital S. Remember, there's one final ingredient in dynamic programming, which is you need to be able to extract the final solution uh, from the subproblem solutions. Most commonly, the original problem literally is one of the subproblems. Uh, that's not true here, right? We want a tour, and here all of the subproblems are computing paths. But now just we can do that exhaustive search over the n minus 1 choices uh, for the last um, vertex visited by the tour, uh, do exhaustive search over those n minus 1 choices, and then just plug in uh, the values of our largest subproblem solutions. So with all the ingredients in place, the dynamic programming algorithm now just writes itself. Right? We're first going to solve the base cases, so the smallest subproblems that will correspond to vertex subsets capital S with only two vertices, uh, vertex 1 and some other vertex. Then we'll move on and use the recurrence to solve the next largest subproblems with uh, the visit past the visit three vertices, uh, then subsets of size 4, and then 5, etc. And once we're through with all of the subproblems, we'll use that final equation to uh, compute uh, the final solution. Uh, this algorithm is sometimes called the Bellman held Karp algorithm. Uh, it was proposed independently in 1962, on the one hand by Bellman, and on the other hand by Held and Karp. So we start by initializing our array that's going to uh, keep track of all of the subproblem solutions. Uh, our subproblems are parameterized by two different parameters, capital S and, uh, and little j, so it's going to be a two dimensional array. Uh, there's a roughly exponential number of choices of capital S, two to the little n minus one, uh, quantity minus one. Uh, to be precise, and then there's at most n minus 1 choices for j, all vertices other than vertex 1. The base cases correspond to the vertex subsets of size 2, so it has to contain vertex 1, and then there's going to be some other vertex, uh, little j, uh, and then little j is the only option for the endpoint as well. And so then the shortest path that goes from 1 to j and visits only 1 and j, that's got to be the direct one-hop path. And we know that's cost. That's just the cost of the corresponding edge. So now we solve all the subproblems systematically, working from smaller subproblems to larger subproblems. And again, the natural notion of problem size here is the number of vertices that the path is supposed to visit, so the cardinality of the set capital S. So we start from size 3 subsets, and then we work up to size 4, et cetera culminating with when capital S is equal to all n vertices. So now we have uh, two more for loops, which are looping over the uh, choices of the parameters capital S and little j. Uh, since little j is supposed to be drawn from the set capital S, it makes sense to first start by looping over uh, all the subsets of the current size, size little s. Then for a given subset, capital S, we know all the choices of J. It's every vertex in capital S except for the vertex 1. So now in this inner loop iteration, it really corresponds to a specific subproblem. The subproblem capital, of computing capital C uh, subscript capital S comma J. And we know how to do that. We just use the recurrence. So it's really just an exhaustive search over all choices little k for the penultimate vertex of an optimal path visiting the vertices in capital S. Once all three of these for loops complete, we've solved all of the subproblems. And then as we know, the final solution can just be computed from the biggest of those subproblems uh, with capital S equal to capital V.
One sanity check that you always want to do when you write down your pseudocode for a dynamic programming algorithm is when you're computing one entry of your uh, subproblem solution array, you want to make sure on the left hand side, you want to make sure that all of the entries that you need from the array on the right hand side are already computed and therefore available for constant time lookup. Uh, and we see that that is indeed the case here. On the right hand side of the recurrence, we're always looking up uh, the value for sets that have one less vertex than capital S, so smaller subsets. All of those will have been uh, computed in the previous iteration of the outermost for loop. So that's the Bellman held carp dynamic programming algorithm for the traveling salesman problem. As always, when we introduce an algorithm, we should think about uh, what are its properties in terms of correctness and in terms of its running time. Uh, correctness is, you know, not not so interesting. It's kind of just, you know, the standard argument for dynamic programming algorithms, which you've seen many times. Uh, you proceed by induction on the subproblem side. So you just argue that each subproblem gets solved correctly. Uh, in the inductive step, you know, why is it true? Well, the correctness comes from the correctness of the recurrence. And we're filling in the subproblem answers correctly. Why is the recurrence correct? Well, that just goes back to the optimal substructure that we started with. We observed that optimal solutions to a given subproblem can only have one of a small number of possibilities, and the recurrence uh, explicitly does exhaustive search over that small number of possibilities, so it necessarily computes the optimal solution. For the running time, we can just go back to our generic analysis of dynamic programming algorithms, where we just count up the number of subproblems, multiply it by the time per subproblem, and throw in the post-processing work. Uh, so here, first of all, how many subproblems are there? That's what we were calling f of n before. Uh, well, there's two to the n choices for the set capital S, a little bit less than that, but roughly two to the n. Uh, and there's always at most n minus one choices for the second parameter, little j. Uh, so that means there's at most two to the n times n different subproblems we have to deal with. How about the time required to solve each subproblem? Well, this is just exhaustive search over all of the possible choices of the penultimate vertex, little k. Uh, there's certainly at most n possible choices for little k all, at all times. Uh, so this is going to be a linear amount of work to fill in each array entry. And then finally, there's the post-processing step, what we were be it, what we were called H of n before. Uh, and so here it's not a constant time lookup, it's, but it's that final line of the pseudocode where you do this exhaustive search over n minus 1 possibilities. Um, each case can be evaluated in constant time. So the post-processing in that final line is also going to be uh, big O of n. So in this analysis of the post-processing, I'm, I'm assuming that you're uh, content to compute just the total cost of a uh, optimal traveling salesman tour as opposed to the tour itself. But as always with dynamic programming, as you've hopefully seen many times, uh, it's always possible to reconstruct the optimal solution itself by tracing backward through the filled in subproblem array. And if you implement this algorithm uh, in the right way, caching the appropriate things on the forward pass, you can actually reconstruct the optimal tour itself uh, in linear time, O of n time. And I encourage you to, to think about that in the privacy of your own home. So remember the formula for the running time bound of a dynamic programming algorithm, it's just F times G plus H which in this case evaluates to n squared times two to the n. All right, so one piece of fine print in this running time analysis, I, I am assuming that uh, you can generate the number of subsets capital S with a given size little s uh, in time proportional to the number of such subsets. If you think about it, the number of such subsets is exactly n minus one, choose s minus one, because you know that the vertex one has to be in there. So this can be done. I encourage you to think about how you might do it in a concrete implementation. Uh, you can use recursive enumeration, or if you really want to sort of venture out into the weeds, uh, you can look up something known as Gosper's hack. So how should we feel about this running time? Well, sort of mixed feelings, uh, I think. I mean, on the one hand, this is a lot better than exhaustive search. It's very satisfying to beat the pants off of exhaustive search, which would have been n factorial. Remember by Sterling's approximation, n factorial, that's roughly n divided by e, n divided by 2.718 raised to the nth power. So that's exponentially bigger than two to the n, whereas here we're just getting two to the n times a, a polynomial times n squared. So that on the one hand is, is deeply satisfying to sort of see yet another kind of killer application of the dynamic programming paradigm that you've spent so much time mastering uh, to beating exhaustive search for a super fundamental problem. Uh, the bad news is, is, you know, this running time is still not that great. Um, so, you know, with the exhaustive search algorithm, you might be able to handle sizes, maybe if you're lucky, up to like 15 or something. Um, if we had an algorithm with running time 2 to the n, you could go up to around 40. Uh, this is n squared times 2 to the n, so you'll, you'll be able to handle more like uh, inputs of size n equals 30. 
So we've doubled uh, the problem size that can be handled compared to exhaustive search, which is nice. Uh, but if you have a traveling salesman problem uh, that's bigger than that, that say has hundreds or thousands of vertices, you're not going to be able to use this dynamic programming algorithm. There you're going to have to resort either to uh, heuristic algorithms as discussed in the last chapter, or you could try your luck with a state-of-the-art mixed integer programming solver, which we're going to talk about uh, later this chapter. So what we're going to move on to next is yet another application of dynamic programming uh, to a problem of finding long paths uh, in networks. It will again allow us to roughly double the problem size that you can handle. But actually in biological applications, that doubling of the problem size that you can handle is totally crucial to getting meaningful results. So we'll talk about that in the next video. See you then.